In this edition of INN CEO Talks, I'm joined by Murray Hill, the Managing Director and CEO of Elevate Uranium. And we are talking about the dynamic increase in interest and need for uranium globally. Murray, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be talking to you. Uranium really is coming into the spotlight these days. What's your take on what the global demand is going to be over the next five to 10 years? Well, we always knew that it was a supply shortage. The, the demand is greater than the supply at the moment. And we expect that the, the incidents in the UK, oh, sorry, the Ukraine with Russia as invasion has exemplified that. And, uh, you know, we're seeing the huge energy costs around the world. Energy demand is increasing. And if you think about it, all these EVs, they keep pushing. If we increase the number of EVs to the number they're talking about, and everybody has one, then we need two to three times as much power in a household. And of course, the left are pushing renewables. Renewables don't cut the mustard at night time or when the wind's not blowing. So nuclear is going to be in stronger and stronger demand. And I think a lot of countries around the world are realising that with the high uh, energy costs and the energy demand increasing. So right at this present, we don't have an uranium we don't have enough uranium to feed the current nuclear fleet, and then we know that nuclear fleet is going to grow. So we've got to produce more uranium, and uh, the only way to incentivise production is for the uranium price to go up. And uh, that's where that's where we see it. It's simple math. So tell us about the projects that you have and where they are, because you've got quite a number. Yeah, look, we're geographically diverse. Uh, we focused on Namibia for a long period of time, uh, and also got some assets in Australia, which just recently picked up. So. The Namibian one, uh, blue sky potential there is enormous. Uh, we've been exploring uh, for the last three years uh, on, a, on a large tenement position. We've discovered copies, uh, Hirabeb, uh, Namib 4, and we're drilling at Capri at the moment. We just got our second rig working. Uh, it, it's quite an exciting time with lots of exploration potential. Demonstrate that we can find resources now. We, we started exploring on copies in July 2019. We had a resource within three years. Uh, which is unprecedented in Namibia. Uh, so we're really demonstrating that we can find uranium and we've got a large land position that we're still working on uh, and we're increasing our exploration efforts in country. So uh, quite exciting times for us in that country. Well, when I was looking on your website, it looks like you've got six projects in Australia and another six in Namibia. What exactly are your plans on being able to, uh, you know, prove those resources and move them forward to potential development or vending in with uh, other uh, major uh, mining companies that can help you bring them to production? Yeah, with so many, there were so many projects, it gives us a great flexibility. So what we're looking at is we don't want to be in a race to production. We want to develop our resources and explore it and build up as large a resource base as possible uh, so that when we get to the point where the uranium price is, is high enough uh, for all to start um, uh, developing again, you know, we've got a choice of projects to go forward with. So Namibia, uh, in particular, a lot of blue sky potential. Australia, we've got sort of more known resources, but then at the same time, we're working on trying to expand those uh, and, and bring some of those projects up to resources. So, yeah, look, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we'll have a choice when it comes to development. And, uh, you know, the big fish take out the smaller ones. And I think we've got enough resources in the bank, uh, you know, will be a, quite an attractive proposition in time. So for a lot of investors, they know Australia as a mining jurisdiction, a mining jurisdiction that they can trust, that has infrastructure, but many do not have familiarity with Namibia. What's the, uh, the environment like there for the development of mining? Well, very good. Um, the Rossing uranium mine have been operating since 1976 on a continuous basis. So, you know, there's 46 years of uranium mining culture. So that's two plus generations of Namibians that are used to uranium mining. Uh, there's the Husab uh, mine operating. Uh, you know, they've got diamonds, they've got gold, they've got copper. But it's quite a diverse um, commodity country. It's the fourth largest producer of uranium in the world. Uh, and it's got a very supportive government. Uh, we, we went over there in July for the first time for three years and uh, asked for a meeting with the minister. He gave us his time, had an excellent meeting with him, uh, encouraging foreign investment in the country uh, so it, it is a great jurisdiction to be in. So for investors right now, when they're taking a look at your company, Murray, uh, what in particular should they be looking at that makes them say, uh, okay, now's a good time for, for me to invest because, uh, you know, you've got good financial resources at the moment, but what's the, the near and long-term future look, look like? 
Well, there's two things, Stuart. One is what we can control and what we can't control. We've talked about what we can't control, and that's the uranium price and the nuclear demand. Right? That's out of our control. But it is very positive. So if you're looking at investing in the industry, now is a pretty good time to do it. From, from what we can control perspective, uh, we're actively exploring in Namibia. We've got two drill rigs operating, second one only just started. Uh, we've got some uh, unprecedented um, results to date with a, with a resource on copies in the first period of tenure of that license. Uh, and then we've got a lot more tenements to explore on. You alluded to six projects. We've got a lot of projects that we're still exploring on. So a lot more work to do there. And we're still looking at acquisitions. And when I say acquisitions in Namibia, it's generally you know, another tenement here or there, right, that we can go and explore on. And then in Australia, of course, we've got uh, some great resources in Australia that we're working on uh, and getting ready to hit that pipeline for production in years to come. But what we have that differentiates us from the rest of our peers is we have this upgrade beneficiation process we developed in-house. It has the potential to lower the cost base, both capital and operating, for these official style deposits that we're looking for by 50%. So that was, we, we developed this process on the Maranek uranium project, which was a low grade project, needed something. Uh, and, and that's what we did. We developed this process to lower the cost base there. And then we realized that, hang on, there's a lot more potential in Namibia and around the world to apply this upgrade process, which is what was the catalyst for us to go and explore and pick up ground at the low in the uranium price. And when we were picking up, applying for ground in 2018, the uranium price was sitting at less than 20 bucks a pound, right? You had to have a bit of foresight to do that. Uh, so we had the foresight and now we're beginning to reap the benefits of that foresight where we're building up a position. We bought these assets in Australia, um, closed the transaction December 19. We started that transaction back in to the end of 18. So it took a while to get that closed. But at the end of the day, we now have a great asset base in, in terms of property and resources to work off uh, to develop this company. So do you think that investors should be looking directly at you as a investment opportunity or should they be looking at you in conjunction with what's happening in the market for uranium? Oh, absolutely the latter. You know, you look at us, uh, we're a standout because we're probably the most active uranium exploration company on the ASX. Most of our peers have a single project or a couple of projects. They're sitting waiting for the uranium price to move. We're not. We're proactive. We're exploring. Uh, but absolutely, you put that in conjunction with what's happening in the nuclear uh, uranium sector and uh, it's compelling the uranium price has got to go up. You saw today, I mean, I'm not sure when this is going to go to air, but the Australia our share price was up 18% today on the back of uh, Japan announcing that they're going to go uh, and start up eight more reactors. So I think any move uh, with countries around the world increasing their nuclear um, a nuclear fleet is going to have a positive impact on, on the, our share price and our, our market capitalization for investors. Yes, I was just reading that Japan wants to uh, build or uh, engage up to nine nuclear reactors by this winter. Uh, and so the demand is going to rise. And then we take a look at what happened in California. Governor Newsom is proposing a $1.4 billion um, you know, uh, injection into keeping the Diablo Canyon power plant uh, running rather than phasing it out. Um, so the need is growing. Um, and of course, yeah. you know, Senator Manchin's deal under the Biden climate uh, agreement uh, sees a huge boost to the nuclear sector as well. So I think you're right. This is a, a really interesting space to be in as we need to move to a more reliable source of clean energy. And, you, and I think we have to thank Michael Schellenberger for a lot of that in the US, uh, particularly in California, but also his contribution to Germany as well. And if you mm -hmm. want to find out why nuclear is better than uh, other energy sources, Google Michael Schellenberger uh, and go to his website or go to his TED talk. Uh, fantastic. Uh, he was anti-nuclear. Now he's gone exact opposite. He's so pro. Uh, he understands the benefit. I mean, decarbonisation is only going to happen if you've got nuclear. Um, and uh, the increasing demand of, of energy. And for some reason, we're pushing this increase in demand for energy without having enough energy to feed these EVs. So, I mean, that's the thing about people think, oh, I've got an EV. Well, a battery stores energy, battery, uh, batteries discharge energy, batteries don't generate energy. It's right. even the hydrogen argument. Hydrogen, you can only produce hydrogen with a lot of energy. So, yes, it becomes an energy source, but you use a lot of energy to produce it. We seem to forget those things, and I think conveniently forget those things. Well, I hope you'll come back and give us an update on, uh, you know, what's happening in Namibia and Australia. I think it's an exciting position that you're in. 
It is. Uh, it's very exciting to be at the helm of a company that's growing as fast as we are and uh, in a, a very exciting sector. Wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much.